while they're being while the children are being dismissed, you can turn to Genesis one, and we're going to read verses one, one, and then twenty five, twenty six, and twenty seven. But before we do, I just want us to take a moment and just invite God into the reading. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for who you are, and we just thank you for your presence. And we thank you that the word of God is Holy Spirit breathe and is living and active. And I thank you that as we open our Bibles, whether it's on a phone or whether it's in an actual living Bible, God, we just thank you that you speak to each one of us and that the words, each word is important. You put each word in. And so we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds. And everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth. I just wanted to read that again. Mm. And over all the earth. Amen. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Mm. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you're wondering why Crystal was reading so slow, it's not because she's having difficulty reading, but all too often we read the Holy Scripture too quick, and um, the words just roll into another word, and it doesn't resonate into our soul, but it hears it in our intellect. And so that's why she read a little bit slow. Thank you so much, Crystal. No, I don't need the mouse. Later on, I'm going to ask you to do something that uh, you probably won't want me to ask you, but I'm going to just warn you ahead of time. So. If you want to be compliant at that time, I would really appreciate it. (laughs) We ask why on so many levels. And the question why is because we feel we need to understand everything in front of us and about us and around us. It's a big word. It's only three letters, but it means a huge amount to each one of us. Often our questions of God arise out of our feelings, the way we feel about things. Feelings concerning our very small world in the picture of the global picture. The devil can use our questions to God to deceive us, causing doubt that could lead to a lack of faith. There's a gentleman called John Piper who wrote in his book, I guess I do need that little thing there. For some reason, my little 
mouse here doesn't connect when something else is connected to it. So if there's a technician in the house, All right, do it manually. So certain things happen in this world, you know, that you wonder why, and here's the question, why are all these things happening this morning when I wanted to be so right in everything I do so as not to embarrass myself. Thank you, Lord, for humiliating me. And um, I was a scout, Colin, from years ago, and so they always taught you in scouts to always be prepared. So here I am. And you know something? There's so many things greater in life than technology. So John Piper wrote in Finally Alive, my feelings are not God. God is God. My feelings do not define truth. God's word defines truth for us. My feelings are echoes and responses to what my mind perceives. And sometimes, many times, my feelings are out of sync with what is really truth. When that happens, and it happens every day in some measure, I try not to bend the truth to justify my imperfect feelings, but rather I plead with God this way, purify my perceptions of your truth and transform my feelings so that they are in sync with your truth in my life. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who I've come to love, he's an expository preacher since past, suggested some questions that we may have asked God in our journey of our Christian life with the triune God. Why is it that when I became a Christian, I was not taken right out of this world? Why is it that when I became a Christian, I was not made immediately perfect and sinless. Why, when I became born again, am I not completely delivered at once from the old nature and everything that belongs to sin and its polluting effect? Why was I not immediately and automatically delivered from all consequences of sin? And why am I not immediately sanctified and holy? Why? Big question. He goes on and says, why am I left in these struggles as I live my life on earth? God dealt with sin through his son Jesus, so why am I subject to death as I read that sin leads to death? Why was death not taken away once and forever as a consequence of Calvary and the resurrection? And why should there have been this long interval between Christ's first coming and his second coming? Why didn't Jesus return either at once or immediately? And indeed, why was there such a long time between the fall of man and the first coming of Christ to deal with sin? Even the psalmist says in Psalm 13, 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me, God? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? There are many of these types of questions in Scripture and even in our own lives that we can resonate with. In the Garden of Eden, where everything starts for humanity, when sin entered Adam and Eve's perfect world, they came to the conclusion that they didn't need God, that God was just not enough for, for them. They turned their back on their creator, they hid from him, and counted their nakedness as something evil and wrong. 
This was the beginning of their struggles, and the entire world became corrupted by sin, which they had no knowledge of, by the way, until they learned another narrative and thought they needed more than what God was able to give them. That fallen nature, that sinful nature, that defiant nature has been passed down throughout humanity's history, even to each of us today. This is where we're at. At one point, that defiant nature caused God to almost wipe out the entire world and its system of his creation. All of us, don't be fooled, all of us inherited that fallen nature. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51.5. We, all of us here, were sinners at birth. David was saying that he was a sinner by virtue of his nature, not because he sinned with Bathsheba. He knew that it must be confronted by God's righteousness and also his holiness. Probably all of us know Job and his journey through life, his great loss of everything and um, his retention of um, his family eventually. But Job is a great study in the absurdity of questioning his creator and is an abject lesson to, in how feeble our understanding can be of his perfect will for us and also his created world. In God asking the question of Job in Job 38, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Remember that next time you ask God the question why. Where were you when I created? Take that personally the foundation of the world. It really tested Job's wisdom. It would also test our wisdom. It was God's challenge to get Job to see the error of his questioning as the creation of the world predated even his own life. It proved God's executive power, which he could never understand in his own intellect. When we question God... From what base of wisdom do we do that? What makes us believe that questioning God is a good or a bad thing or something that we are given to do? Are our questions a point of us trying to make out something in our lives that is not quite right? That we cannot continue to go into tomorrow without finding the answer today of what our question is all about. Our ancestors, Adam and Eve, wanted to know something that God did not want them to know about. God did not want Adam and Eve to know about evil. That's just something he didn't want them to experience. If you're standing on the edge of a cliff, you don't ask somebody to jump off to go 300 feet down to the rocks to find out how it would affect their body. God didn't want you or I to know what evil was all about. The seducing spirit of Satan through the snake in the garden should tell us all about why the world is like it is today. That spirit is a continual battle in this world and even more so for a Christian. He is out to destroy those that God loves. Psalm 42 11 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Although these questions refer to a man whose uh, condition was based on the fact that he couldn't get to the temple like he did every year, but it's a fitting statement for us who continually question our God about our life in this world as a Christian. One who is born again, who has the new nature and not that nature inherited from our ancestors, Adam and Eve, and all who followed them. Woe to us 
when we question the things about what God wants to do in our life. Just as in Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, who counseled him incorrectly about his situation, that God really wasn't concerned about his situation. So many times we ask, God, where are you in this? What is your plan for my life? Why me? Why me? It's a frustrating form of questioning because things are just not going pleasurable for us. Why me, Lord? Why is this happening? When is it going to be over? When am I going to see the light at the end of the tunnel? When is this issue going to be resolved? Why can't I do something about it? What is happening to me? So many questions. There's no more important statements in our life today than what we find that Gail read so very well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If, by the way, that you do not believe that, you have no faith whatsoever going forward. It's a statement of fact that you need to embrace. And God made the beasts of the earth and all the other things. And then he said, as Gail eloquently put, let us make man in our own image. You imagine that the Holy Father said, let us make man in our own image. Does that statement prove to anybody that God actually doesn't know what he's doing? Or does that actually prove to you and increase your faith and give you confidence in the creator that actually God knows everything about you and your life and your trials and your tribulations? It's your choice to believe that or the other. The nature of mankind was in a perfect relationship in perfect harmony with the one who created them. A nature that walked and talked with him every day. A nature in a place that God created for fellowship and beauty that was to be perfect and forever. As God challenged Job, as we read in Job chapter 38 through chapters 42, we understand the incredible nature of God. Shall we ask, is God sovereign? Shall we ask, does God have power and authority over creation? Is he your ruler? Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is God able to exercise his rule in our lives? Maintain his presence in our lives in which we live and struggle. It's interesting to note that God's rule is not impersonal or mechanical, but loving and gracious in oversight as well as redemptive. Jesus the Christ is also sovereign inasmuch as that God the Father sent him and gave him the authority to have dominion over all things. He was the one sent by the Father, not you, not me. He was the one that the Father sent, who paid the price, the penalty, the indignity of sin. However, he rose to life in glorious power. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, they call him Dr. Jones, says this, and I'll read verbatim. It's so true. There is a great conflict going on in this world between unseen spiritual forces, a great and mighty conflict between God and all who belong to him and the devil and all who belongs to him. The world is controlled by the devil, this world that we're in. He is the God of this world. He rules in the midst of men and women who belong to the world. He is the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, says the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.2. The devil hates God and the Lord Jesus Christ with all his might, being, and power. 
He hates you and all that God's people are. The result is that all who are controlled by the devil are of necessity antagonistic towards us. Just try sitting down one day with a colleague at work or a family friend that's not saved and start talking about Jesus. It's so easy to talk about the things of God. It's so difficult to talk about the things of Jesus. And woe behold, when you start talking about the Holy Spirit, there's just a sense of antagonism when you mention those truths. We saw that in Pastor Isaac's teaching at our last meeting when Satan was trying to stop the word from being shared with the proconsul by Saul. He doesn't want you to know that God is capable of looking after you in providing for you and protecting you. He doesn't want you to know that. He wants to throw things in front of us to cast aspersions and doubt, even within the same assembly. Jesus had an occasion in John 17, one of, one of the uh, chapters in, in the New Testament that I, I just read and read and read over and over because it's not that I can't believe it, but it's so beautiful the way Jesus talked. There he is in front of his disciples, now talking audibly, just as I am to you, but over here I'm going to be killed. I'm going to hang on a cross. I'm going to be speared. I'm going to pour my blood out. And I'm going to save you from the sin that you inherited from the fall. But he has this to say. I'm coming to you now, Father. Just imagine. You're listening to Jesus right now. Because this is the word from the Holy Spirit. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. My joy within them, and I'm going to be killed on the cross? I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus knows your weakness. He knows my weaknesses. And I'm ashamed. But I have those. Even those of us with little faith. He did not ask God, his father, to take us out of the world. He knew what we were going to go through in this life to get to being with him forever. In all our questioning over time, the simple and correct answer is, if you are wondering, it's just God's way. It's his determination, his planning, and his will. The question is, are we content to know that this is God's way, that the life we live right now in our relationships, in our work, in our retirement, whatever, is his way? Should we know the why of everything that concerns us all of the time? Would that make us comfortable? Is it correct to understand that our faith should be that what God does is always right and that there is no need to ask the question why? Is it for us to just believe and accept and above all just purely submit to the way God wills our life to go? Throughout Holy Scripture it is shown that God's grace and mercy shows us his reasons most of the time. God acts according to his perfect will, not to your will. Just a couple of examples. Remember Moses? effectively asked God to be taken out of this world when he came down from the hill or the mountain and saw that they'd made a craven image in the shape of a, calf, a golden calf. He'd asked God to take him out. 
and his prayer was not granted. Elijah beat out 850 false prophets. Can you imagine being in a location and something you said and something you did literally destroyed 850 people right in front of you? He was later found crying and asked God for him to take, be taken out of the world from that situation. And that prayer was also not granted. Jonah, remember him? Read about his time leading into Nineveh. His prayer was not granted either. As they were not taken out, we are not taken out. You're just going to stay here until God wants you elsewhere. Jesus said, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Jesus came into the world to preach the truth and to present the gospel and to make way of salvation for each one of us here. He proclaimed that the kingdom of God has come. Although Jesus spoke audibly to the disciples of his time, it was a word meant for us as well. In John 17, 20, 26, we read, my prayer is not for them alone. Here's the kicker. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Well, it's been over 2,000 years you've heard their message. They've written enough. The Holy Spirit moved upon them to write certain words. And you've read them, you've studied them, you've listened to them. So Jesus is saying 2,000 years ago, it's for those people, that's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be given, also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want, Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and for them to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. What a position to be in. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may also be in them. Some don't know. Some forget as Christian, we are God's and Christ's representative in this world and sometimes we hide from all the reasons why we exist. It is not to be born. It is not to grow up. It is not to live our life separate from the gospel. It is not to accumulate wealth, position, toys, money, worldly security. There's a joke for you. There is no security in this world. Are we the salt of the earth for God as Jesus wanted us to be? Are we the light of the world for God as Jesus wanted us to be? Now those are the real questions to ask. This is our calling. These are the reasons we have life. It is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me that dynamically changes the reason why you're here today. This is our calling. What would the world be like if Jesus said to the Father, why did you send me here? I don't like this place. It's full of sin and wicked people. Take me out now. That would be a terrible thing. You wouldn't even be here today. We're also left in the world because it is part of our growth and perfection. The thing is, when Jesus comes back with all of the things that happen in our life, we are still not fit 
to be received by God. There will be a time in the future, holding the mic, it's soon, because that's the Holy Spirit speaking through prophecy. God used him today to share with us. I said this before, I'll just repeat it. It's almost like God saying to Jesus, Jesus, go. Preach the word. Save them. Sanctify them. Fill them with grace. Give them mercy. Help them repent from their sins. And help them rely on you. Because when you've done all of that, then when you've done all of that with all of them that I gave you to do it to, bring them to me and present them without spot or wrinkle with your righteousness. That's what I want you to do, Jesus. So go, go do it. And that's our position today. Question God, why did God do that? Figure it. Figure it out. Grace and mercy. Wow. Our lives are to reflect, reflect his grace, to display the riches of his grace and his loving kindness to the world. This is why you and I are still here to this day. I don't know if you've heard about him, but Henry Kirk White was a uh, English poet and hymn writer. He was born in 1785, and he lasted for 21 years before the Lord took him home. And he wrote this piece. Shrink not, Christian. Will you, will you yield? Will you quit this painful field? Will you flee in danger's hour? Know you not? your captain's power. When we walk with the Lord in the light of this world, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Richard Sibbs. There's some really old people in my portfolio here. He was born in 1577. He was an Anglican theologian. He says this, Whatever you are going through in life today, Understand that the more we depend on a wise doctor, the more we shall observe his direction to be careful to use what he prescribes for us. It is Christ's manner to trouble the soul, and then he comes with healing in his wings. God is certainly the best of us when it comes to answering, to answer asking questions. He's, he takes the cake. He asks the best questions of all. And it's not just simply W-H-Y. It's deeper. I'm going to read Job 38. And this is what I'm, I want to ask you. Don't look at your phones. Don't look at your Bibles. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. But I don't want you to be distracted on trying to find out which word is in your trans. Literation. I just want you to concentrate on something. Will you put yourself in a position, and this is not, I'm not trying to force you to do anything. I want you to be totally, dis undis I, I don't want you to be distracted, but I want you to imagine right now that you are in the presence of God, which in reality you are, but you're physically standing in front of the Holy One, and you are perfectly mentally naked, spiritually naked, and physically naked. naked, And this this is what God is asking you after you've queried him on why. Are you with me? 
Then the Lord answered Job out, then the Lord answered you out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man or a woman. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of glory of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors? When I said, this far you may come but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop? Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and the upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me how you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it into its territory, that you may know the paths of its home. Do you know it? Because you were born then? Or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow? Or have you seen the treasury of the hall, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused, or the east wing scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel from the overflowing water or path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to sanctify the desolate waste and cause to spring forth the growth of tr tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the cluster of the Philistines or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Mazaroth in its season or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens can you set their dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven when the dust hardens in clumps and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion? or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lurk in their lairs to life, to wait in li and to lie in wait? Who provides food for the raven? And when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? God is too gracious to say, who do you think you are? He doesn't take that tact, and we do. Who do you think you are, God, to mess in my life? It's not going my way. Those are serious questions. Job, well, thank you, Job, for being transparent. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Well. Luann, could you come up with the worship team, please? I want to ask you a question today. And I've asked this to me, myself, all the time. 
Can I trust everything to God? Lord, Lord, I repent when I have not trusted you in this situation. Can we trust everything to God? Let us repent of not doing so at times and enjoy the comfort and peace that he has unfailing love for us, that he wants the best for us without tiring to give, yes, even through our trials and tribulations. I'll ask you another question, or several questions, quickly. Is there someone else or something else that you can look for for peace that we cannot understand? Safety that we do not deserve? Life and life more abundantly? Provision for all our needs, protection from evil, promises for our eternal life. There's an assurance of knowing God and trusting God. Do you remember Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? There they were in the fire. Did God quench the fire? No. He sent someone in the fire to be with them. He just put Jesus in there with them and they came out unsinged and without smoke. It is not about God stopping all the bad things that happen in our life. It is about who is in there with you mm -hmm. and alongside you. Mm -hmm. J.C. Riley wrote, The deepest level of worship is praising God through the pain thanking God through the trials, trusting him when we are tempted to lose hope, and loving him even when he seems distant. Mm -hmm. At my lowest, he says, God is hope. Mm -hmm. At my darkest, he says, God is my light. At my weak, weakest, he says, God is my strength. Mm -hmm. And at my saddest, God is my comforter. My last word is this. When God ever talks about the family of God and unity, he is talking not about you and I liking each other, Mike. It's about are you born again and have you been sealed by the Holy Spirit? If I'm in the same capacity as you, you and I are in unity. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth about the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has done everything imaginable to teach us about our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit was involved in the Father sending Jesus into the human frame. The Holy Spirit was involved in raising Jesus from the dead. And the Holy Spirit has come as comforter and teacher and revealer of all things attaining to God, pertaining to God. So, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Trust everything to him. Yes, everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. You ask, why? Because he wants you to. Mm -hmm. 